So Emo, let's talk about uh, you enlisted in the service and talk about your home, what were you doing, uh, what made you go into the service, and why did you pick the Navy? Well, I was, um, I was a junior in high school, and the war was on, and I was soon to be 18 years old. So I, when I was 18, I signed up for the draft board in Stratford, Connecticut, and they called me very shortly after that, they called me in, and, and they wanted me to take a physical. I took my physical, and I asked them if I'd be able to serve, be, finish my senior year in high school. And they said I'd be drafted somewhere in October, so I wouldn't be able to start my senior year even. So in that case, I enlisted in the Navy. And in the Navy, they interviewed me, what would you want to want to be? All those young guys at that time wanted to go to some kind of school, and they named a lot of schools for me. I was, I was trying to get to be an engineer, but uh, that, I guess that was filled up. And they came across pharmacist mate, which I didn't know much about it, but it sounded good to me. And I said, well, I'll take pharmacist mate. And I'm glad today that I did because uh, it was quite educational and I enjoyed what I did. Uh, I didn't enjoy people being wounded, but I enjoyed you know, trying to take care of them. Let's talk about the um, experience of boot camp. Uh, start from the day that you went to boot camp. Where did you go? What are your memories of boot camp, and particularly any instructors that you mm -hmm. remember? Mm -hmm. Talk about that, please. I went to boot camp in Rhode Island, Newport, Rhode Island. And as all those new guys were walking in, and all the people who were there ahead of us, probably only a few weeks before us, had their heads out the window and saying, you'll be sorry, you'll be sorry. And uh, it sounded like a, a rough, rough place to live. But uh, we soon realized that they were heckling us and we got over that. And I was lucky, I was in the barracks with uh, about 50 guys and uh, we slept in hammocks and we had guide ropes that, so that uh, we wouldn't fall out. And our, our guy, the one who was the head of our barracks was a chief, Chief Barber his name was, and he was a very nice guy, a very lenient guy. But we could hear the, the guy who was the head of the barracks next door giving all kinds of commands, he was like a very rough guy. So uh, we were glad we had Barber. And uh, one of the things I remember happening was that uh, uh, this, this fellow of mine, he's from Stratford, he was uh, sleeping at night and I had night duty. And it was about two o'clock in the morning and he was hanging half out of his bed. I was afraid he'd fall out so I kind of tapped him and woke him up. And he said, oh, well, I'm all right. And he turned over and fell out of his hammock. <laughs> and uh, then another thing I remember about boot camp is what they call happy hour when you have all the exercises. You stay there for about an hour all times of exercises. And early, early in the morning, before breakfast, we would run around the compound. And I would start to run, and it's always happened to me that I would get such a pain in my side, I'd have to stop. It was just, I guess, a second win. I stopped for about, oh, maybe 30 seconds to a minute, and they all got ahead of me. The pain went away, and then I didn't have the pain the rest of the time I ran, and I'd catch up to the other fellas. And that's how I did the comp. I had the pain, but I was able to overcome that. But boot camp was, was a great learning experience, and uh, you, you finally learn to be obedient and obey and do what you're told. It's not like high school. You don't get away with too much, and so if, if, if you do what they tell you, you're fine. Did you, you mentioned somebody from Stratford. Do you remember? The I think his name was Donnelly. I think it was Hank, well, I think it was Hank, it was Donnelly. Were there any other guys who you remember? Yes, there from? was, but I forgot who they were now that I went. Oh, Officer Schreiber went boot camp with me. He was my swimming partner when we were practicing, and it was sad but for Officer Schreiber because when we were discharged, he was on the police force, and Dominic's restaurant was being robbed, and he went for the call, and he got shot. And uh, he was about ready to come home from the hospital after he was in for probably a week or so. He was Dr. Hennessy's patient, I remember. He was sitting up and then all of a sudden he took a turn for the worse and he died. Died from his gun wounds. But that I remember that I was in boot camp with Officer Schreiber. Well, that was actually a big event in the town of Stratford because I believe that might have been the last time 
police officer was killed in the line of duty. Is that I, correct? I think you're right. I yeah. think you're right. Do you yeah. recall what year that was? It was early after I was discharged. I would guess that was around 48, 49, 47. One of those year, 1948, I would say. Okay, and his name was Donnelly? His name was uh, Schreiber. His last oh, name Schreiber. was, and what was his last name? I can't think of his last name. I used, I used to know it. I don't know, but I remember the last name was Schreiber. <clears throat> well, you finish up your boot camp, and... Uh, can you pick up now, where did, did, did you come home? Did you go somewhere else? And pick up where you went after boot camp. I think we went right to school to learn to become a corpsman. And uh, I went to a Portsmouth, Virginia, and uh, Portsmouth Naval Hospital, where we, have, we studied. And uh, it was supposed to be like a 13-week course, but we broke up in our sixth week. They gave us quick, we did it very quickly. And uh, I, li I liked it there because it was warm. It was, and, and I remember being awfully cold in the morning, standing outside waiting for the chow hall to open. But at nighttime, around 6 o'clock, we were playing softball with our T-shirts. It was so warm. And I kind of enjoyed that kind of weather. But then from there, I went to, uh, I, after, after I became a corpsman, I went to the National Naval Medical Center in Bethesda, Maryland. I believe I had a time off at home before I went to Bethesda, Maryland. And then after I was in Bethesda, I was there for about two to three months. I worked in the tower of that building, and I worked on officers. And uh, I was able to come home most every weekend. And I took every opportunity, because I didn't know when I'd be able to come home again. And so I was home quite a few weekends when I was in Bethesda, Maryland. But one of the things I, I liked to do, I was playing table tennis, that was my hobby. And I looked up and there was a table tennis club in Washington, D.C., which is only a bus ride away from uh, where I was stationed. And every, every liberty I had, you could see me in that club playing table tennis. And, uh, and I just had to take a bus ride and get back to the hospital. And I enjoyed that very much. I, I seldom went roller skating or anything like that. I was playing table tennis. And you became an accomplished table tennis. Yes, I, I, after the war, I kept playing table tennis. I went, to, I went to five national championships in a row playing all different kind of players. And I, and I was ranked, I think, 27, then 23. Then I finally got down to 15 nationally. I was ranked 15th nationally. But I couldn't get any better. People, people after that are so much better, so good, that it, it's hard to advance. Let's go back to your um, corpsman training. Uh, talk about what are the things that you did and what did you learn? in corpsman training? What did you have to do? Well, first thing, one of the first things we learned is uh, uh, how to shoot a rifle, how to handle how, how to handle a rifle. And, but we learned that on, a, on actually on a, I think it was a BB gun, actually a rifle BB gun. It was uh, just for practice. It shows how to put the strap around your shoulder, how to get in a prone position, how to squeeze the trigger and things like that. So the next time we went for practice, it was a real gun. I think they were Remingtons, and uh, I didn't care for rifle practice. I didn't know if I'd ever be, have to shoot a gun, but the recoil I got, I, I weighed about 115 pounds at that time, and the recoil was probably pushing me back. And, and every time I shot at the target, my instructor would say, well, you're close, or you hit it, or you're this and that, and I, I really didn't care what he said. I was just glad I got the shot off. And when I was through with the rifle practice, I was, I was happy about that. I'm not one for a rifle. What about the corpsman? What did you do as corpsman training? Well, that's in Bethesda. That's, in, that's when I went to uh, Portsmouth, Virginia. That, that we learned how to give, give uh, morphine shots, one of the things. We didn't know we were going to handle patients. And, and I guess we, we learned how to bandage people up. And it was kind of a medical training. And it's kind of hard to get all those, learn all those words that they use in the medical world. But um, we did pretty good, I thought. And the best, best thing we did, I learned to do, is I give the service as a corpsman. If you get, if you get them water, get them, get them a urinal, get them the bedpan, give them a shot of morphine. And uh, there's so many things that you have to do when they're in bed there. And that's what my job ended up being. And I felt good about being able to, being a good nurse to them is what it is. Let's pick up on um, 
your experiences. What what is the first ship you get on, and let's take us until you get to the South Pacific. How did you end up? There? Okay, so from Portsmouth, well, I went to Bethesda, Maryland, and then from Bethesda, Maryland, I was shipped to the. Uh, it's a naval yard, like where, they, where it was like a layover, and we were there for about four or five days before we got our orders, and we we were transferred out to Wainimi, Port. No, Port. Well, I'm getting mixed up. Port Wainimi, Port Wainimi. Yeah, it, it is Port Wainimi uh, base up in in California. It was a CB base, and the reason. Oh, I, I have to go back a little bit before that. Before that. I, I went from Bethesda, Maryland, I went to this, to this what, it, what it was a whole over play, where they held this over. And uh, I'm trying to think now, they held this over. It was in Washington, D.C., where we stayed for about four days. And then they shipped us to the naval base, Port Wainimi. And in Port Wainimi, I was there for uh, oh, a couple of months. And. Uh, I had a chance to go to uh, Hollywood. Never, never went to um, Los Angeles because I was only 18 or so, and I didn't drink at the time anyway. So I went to the canteen, Hollywood canteen, places like that. And from there, I went to. They shipped us at night to Frisco, and we boarded a ship which was the USS Bolivar. No, it wasn't it? We boarded a ship, and they they brought us to Pearl Harbor. And at Pearl Harbor. I was stationed at the 3rd Naval Construction Regiment for about four weeks. And see, I, and I have to go back, the important part of the whole thing, but I want to tell you was that, is that when I was in Washington, D.C., they, they did ship us to Camp Lee, Virginia, which is an army camp. They had 20 corpsmen and 20 CBs, or 40 corpsmen and 40 CBs, uh, all learning how to set up uh, fumigation chambers and shower heads, and, I, and the, the idea was for two corpsmen and two CBs to be a team, and I guess go in the Pacific and set up portable shower heads and fumigating chambers so we could fumigate their clothes and whatnot. And that's how I ended up with the CB uh, in Honolulu in the CB camp, which was only about two blocks away from Hickam Field. After about four weeks of that, which was kind of kind of fun because they had a Basketball court, we played basketball, ping pong, we, we, we were on our own. A lot of the men with me were letting their beard grow because with no inspections we were around. I couldn't let mine grow because I didn't have a beard at that time of my life. So, uh, but anyway, after that, um, they, they, they disbanded, they didn't, they didn't go through with the fumigation the bath, and the corpsmen, a good many of them anyway, was sent to one base 128 hospital, which was in Honolulu, right where we were. And I worked at one base, base, 120, uh, base 128 hospital. I worked there for, I, I can't remember how many weeks. I, I must have had at least six, eight, with two months, at least two months there probably. And from there, a fleet came in and drafted 13 of us corpsmen onto this fleet, onto the ship. The ship was the USS Bolivar. And at the ship I was on, all the time I had sea duty, except at times in the Pacific when I was transferred from time to time to help out on other ships. Okay, let's go back to um, when you mentioned about being in Hollywood. You went to the Hollywood Canteen. Is that where the USO? Um, yeah, that, that was the USO there? Hollywood Canteen, yeah. I was and there. there were entertainers there and, yeah, right. and so forth? Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, there were, there were, I never saw, uh, uh, very well-known star, but I think I saw Helen Broderick, who was known for comical dancing and stuff like that. I think I, I think I remember seeing her, but that's the only one I remember seeing. So now, when you went to the boat Boulevard, which is your ship now that you're going to serve on, yeah. And now at this point, you're heading for the South Pacific, right? Okay. You went through. You mentioned you went through Pearl Harbor. Did you? Did you see the areas where the where the battle had taken place? I'm, I'm, I'm sure we took a walk to Hickam Field. And I don't remember much about that. And then we then we walked. We we went to, we went to Honolulu on Liberty, and the Waikiki Hotel was turned over to the Navy, 
and it was a beautiful beach. I, didn't, I was disappointed it wasn't very long, but it was a nice beach. And I spent the time just going to Honolulu back in the, and it, it wasn't, all the damage done by the air raids, I, I would have to say, uh, it was, must have been cleaned up by the time we got there. Which that was in 41, I didn't get there till 43. And also, never seen the monument that's there, because it, it was still sunk by the time, it was, that was after the war they made that monument and everything. But it was a nice experience in Hawaii, and we all, when I was in Hawaii too, I'd stay at that, that, that hospital, um, we had a trip to, to, to the area where we picked up some bananas on the way and things like that. Something different that you don't do in Connecticut. So now you're on the boulevard and you're heading to South Pacific. Yeah. Uh, fraught with dangers. Uh, were you, there must have been things going on, concerns about submarines or airplanes or whatever during that time. Anything happen, yeah, any not, events? Or? Not, not going over. And I would say that, uh, I don't know about the other guy, but I was so green on uh, going aboard ship, I didn't even know what a hole was. The hole was where they, they had two or three numbers and that's where they lowered all the cargo and everything and the hole down two or three decks below. And, but I didn't know what the hole was. I didn't know what the bridge was. I had to find out the bridge is where the, the admiral is or the captain is. I didn't know what the forecastle was. That was the front of the ship, the forward. But I did know what the back of the ship was. Cause what did they call it? The, what they were. But even going like the bulkhead, I found out that's the wall. Bulkhead is the wall. So I had to learn all these terms. We were so green. But the only thing we did do when we were on the ship, we all given a Mae West to wear, a lifesaver jacket to wear. And, and then I think also they had life-saving belts if they didn't want to wear a jacket or something. But we wore them all the time for a while. For a while we wore them, for a while. Then after a while we got the Get, like everything else, you forget about them, and you, then you know, then the fair is gone. I think you forget about maybe you could be torpedoed or anything like that. We, it wasn't hitting us right there that we're going to warfare. To tell you the truth, we're just traveling. So, then we, from that's when I, I finally uh, we didn't go right there. I think we stopped at um, one of the islands. I think we stopped at one of the islands to pick up the troops and all that. I'm sure we did to pick up troops because we were uh, our our ship was going to go to Lady. That was the first invasion I was on, we went to Lady, and I can't tell you the exact date of Lady. I have to look it up in the history book, but so that's... So that was the first invasion that you were involved in, was the... Was the Lady, Lady, L-E-Y-T-E, Lady. You had troops aboard ship. Yeah, we had troops. And okay, yeah. and you, you weren't uh, involved with the troops that no. were aboard ship? No, on the board ship, yeah. No? Yeah. Okay, so... Did the troops then landed on Lady? Yeah. And then you did you stand by as a hospital ship? Yeah. And well, what, casualties? well, what we did all the way over to Lady, on our way over to Lady, we made what we call four by four. There were bandages, four inches by four inches. We would take the cloth and we'd make a bandage, cut and make the band. We made many, many, many bandages because we didn't know how many casualties we'd have. We'd have to use them for like to stop the blood and all that stuff. We did that on the way over. And I remember um, being, being in the convoy and everything. And when we got there, there were so many ships. But I think I saw more at this other place too, but there were so many ships. And we, of course, we carried small boats, and that's how the invasion works. Uh, the, the morning of the invasion, everybody's up early, had a good breakfast, all that. And uh, then the men got loaded into the small boats, the small boats got loaded. Got, got, got put down the water, and then they would circle the ship until it was time for the attack. But there were a lot of ships like ours doing the same thing. So when the time for the attack was, was done, and all, all those small boats were going in at one time. And our, our ship was always anchored too far off the shore to hear any noise. I couldn't hear any noise. Uh, and sometimes you could see a tank or something. I did at one of the islands. And I saw a flag at one of the islands too, but uh, we're too far away. But it would be later in the afternoon when the, the casualties start coming in. And that same night, that the D-Day on Lady, the same night, us, us 13 temporary corpsmen got transferred to another ship where they probably needed more help. And I guess they, they get the casualties depending how they're lined up for casualties, I suppose. Some gets a lot of ships, some gets a lot of casualties, some don't. 
So I don't remember too many casualties that lady. I know there was plenty. I know there was a lot, but my ship probably didn't get that many. So you, what would you do during? The oh time? no, the, the, during uh, on one of the ships I remember. Um, I, but I'm getting ahead of myself at Evil. But on one of the ships I remember, my job was uh, to hand down sandwiches to the working crew that were unloading all the vehicles on the ship. Besides the men going in. These, these, this crew, their job was unloading the ship, and they'd get it all unloaded in one day or so. But I was standing there, when they come in, I'd hand down sandwiches to them, maybe a drink too, whatever it was, until we got casualties. Once we got casualties, they needed me in the sick bay, and then I would go in the sick bay. But that, by the time, the ship was probably pretty well unloaded late in the afternoon, you know? Nothing like that. Did you get to meet or know any of the, the uh, rest of the staff, like the doctors and yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. When I know the doctors, and, and only one guy I remember the name was the senior. I guess most ships, I think, like ours, carry three doctors. Two were young doctors, and one was a senior doctor, older doctor. And the older doctor's name was Dr. Matros. I remember that name, Dr. Matros. And uh, when, when, when they were younger doctors were stumped on something, well, probably they, they, did, they knew what they were doing. They didn't know what was, was trying to save lives. But when it comes to probably crucial operations or whatnot, maybe Dr. Matrix was there to help them or do the work, step in. But I don't know. I, I was never in, in this. Well, I was in the sick bay, but I can't remember a lady too much. Maybe it wouldn't. Well, let, let's pick up then on um, there were other islands that you were yeah. off of. But we get to February of 45 was a, the main battle, and that was the Battle of Iwo Jima that right. you were involved in. Right, right, right. And it's, right. Um, in fact, it's mentioned in a book, which if you can hold up this copy of the book, so that, uh, because there's an excerpt in here uh, of yours, just so we can see that. Yeah, it's called Never in Doubt Remembering Iwo Jima, and there's a, a chapter devoted to you in that book where you tell about your experiences off of Iwo Jima. Uh, so I would like you now to pick up on the story of uh, Iwo Jima through Iwo Jima's eyes, what, what happened going into the battle and how that all unfolded in your perspective. Mm. Well, I, I, I get to know some of, the, some of the people who went in, the Marines, because we would get together at night Sometimes we probably play cards or do things, you know, but you get to know I never got to know them close, close, but uh, I guess fairly well. And that morning, uh, I remember talking to one man, and I, I realized he probably wanted to be alone, uh, alone, with, probably with his prayers or whatnot. But they, uh, excuse me a minute, they finally, they, they went over, they, they the command came in to go overboard, and they, they landed in small boats. And uh, then they, I watched them circle the ship for a while. And I was very fortunate, I thought, that I never had to go in. I never had to leave any of the ships I was on. But I think it was pretty tough for those guys to go in. And uh, as everyone knows today, it was a very tough, bloody battle. But my job that day, I remember, though, was handing down sandwiches, particularly. And later in the afternoon, around 2 o'clock, um, we saw a flag on the island. And we looked through the telescope, we could see it, then we looked through the telescope and we were sure we saw the flag. And all these years, I thought that was the flag that was most famous. I found out years later that it wasn't. They had put up a flag, I was, we were right about that, but the flag that was most famous was put up a little bit later around and back of the mountain, there was a mountain in front of us, and it was around back of the mountain, so we never could have seen the famous flag, but I thought that was it all these years. But then that same thing same, happened at the other ships. Uh, uh, that night, D-Day, that night, they transferred us over to the President Jackson. And the President Jackson got an awful lot of casualties, many, many casualties. And the Jackson II was noted that it was the first ship that landed on Guadalcanal. So these ships had been in a lot of service before. They got a lot of casualties. And I was put it in, a, in a, a compartment where me and this other fella had 50 or 52 bed patients. The compartment next to me had a, 
250 or 225 patients, but they were ambulatory, they can walk. But our patients couldn't get out of bed. One fella did get out of bed, he tried twice, he passed out twice on this, then we put him back. And I guess he was kind of, and I guess he would be embarrassed to use a bedpan. So he waited at night time, and we got him out of bed into the aisle, and that's when he used the bedpan, things like that. But these fellas kept us busy entirely. We, we never stopped a moment because of 50 bed patients. When you're walking by a bed to get somebody, say water, the other guy would ask for a urinal, another guy would ask for a bedpan, another guy had pain, would ask for a morphine shot. And this was a continual thing, and some would just get a pill, but it was a continual thing all the time, me and this fella was working. And I think we slept about four hours a night if we slept that much. We didn't sleep much. Uh, I had one corpsman, I had one patient say to me, when do you sleep? Well, you're always here, we never see you. And that was why we didn't sleep much. And I said to him, well, you know, you guys did your job on the beach. Started trying to do our job here. And we did. And I'm, I'm thankful to say that I think we did a good job as far as giving all the service we could give. And at one point, I had to go to sick bay to get something from one of my patients. And uh, as I'm going to sick bay, there was this fellow in the bottom bunk and he had a leg missing. And he said to me, Corman, he said, could you clean me up? He still had sand on him from the beach and whatnot. And I said, okay. Uh, and I knew I was in a hurry to get back to my own patients, but I, I couldn't resist him. So I, I got a washcloth or whatever I had to get and I cleaned him up. And as I turned around, there was another fella on the other side, the same thing, he had a leg missing. And I had to say to him, would well, you want me to clean you up also? And he said, no, he must have known I had to get back. He said, no, that's okay. Then there was another time I was in a sick bay for something. I think it was two doctors carrying a stretcher across. And one doctor was taking uh, uh, the pulse and temperature and, and, uh, of this patient they're carrying. And he said to the other doctor, and he was, and the other doctor was feeding him the blood. He was holding the, the blood up high, feeding him the blood as they're walking. And the doctor taking the, the pressure and all that said, uh, uh, save the blood. He said, he's gone. He died right there. Uh, I've seen a few other things that would happen. And uh, also on one time when there were I think that was the ship that they were, were on, and uh, a small boat was coming back. It was, it was out all night, it got lost, it coming back. And I guess the rule of the ship was that you couldn't, you couldn't stay in a boat when they, when, they, when they hoisted the boat on the deck. You had to climb the ladder, get out of the boat, climb the ladder. So, but the lieutenant, who was in charge, he, he, he came up and he asked the officer the day, if he could have permission to leave two men on the boat while they hoisted it up because uh, they were sick. And they got permission. So they hoisted the boat up and they got it half over the side of the ship and the winch broke and the boat fell. Everything went in the water except the bow. Well, there was a fellow standing on the bow holding the cable as they were raising the boat. And he fell in the water and he wasn't hurt. But there was another fellow, if we looked down, he floated up, he had his Mae West on, he floated up but his head was in the water and we were calling to the, to pick his head out of the water. But before that, we were pulling on the cable, a whole bunch of us were pulling. We couldn't budge the boat, we were trying to get the boat up out of the water, we couldn't budge it. So anyway, soon after that, a boat did come around and picked up the guy that was floating and the other guy said, and I saw that man who floated up the next day and I talked to him and he was okay, he was okay. But uh, we did lose one on the boat. There was at least one on the boat that went down with that, when that happened. And I can't think of too many other things that evil, that... Uh... So, so your experience off of Iwo Jima um, went on for about how long? A, a couple of days, a mm -hmm. week? Uh... No, we were there, we were there 15 days, I think. The first, I would say the first three or four or five, oh, I, I'm glad you mentioned that. The first three days we took care of these patients by ourselves. The doctors didn't see them anymore. They were too busy working the sick bay trying to save lives. After they got through with the sick bay, this young, this other doctor's kind of young, 
he came in to take care of my patients. And this, the chow hall was right next to my department. So all we had to do was take them off the bunks and go in the chow hall and they set up a table where they could lay them on. And he gave them penicillin, no, no, whatever puts you to sleep, I forgot what it was. I think it was penicillin or something like that. It was a drug. It was kind of new. They use it today, but they but they they know how to regulate it and everything. But again, and they have we'd have the guys to count backwards from twenty. When you get to be about thirteen, they fall asleep and they do the operating. But the main thing I bring out about this doctor was, I think he was supposed to go in on the beach party. I've heard the story. I don't know if that's true. I heard the story, but he couldn't get himself to go in, and he stayed on board ship. It seemed like he was going to make up for what he didn't do, and he took care of all those patients. He, he, he band took him, and then when they were all fixed up, ready to go back to the bunk, I went to carry the stretcher, and he pushed me aside. He wouldn't let me carry the stretcher. He carried it back himself with the other guy. Carry that, and I think it was meant to be like that. That that guy was meant to stay on board ship of all the good he did. It's really, really good. And you mentioned that some doctors did go in with the landing party. One doctor did. Well, there's one doctor. That, and no, the other doctor stayed on board ship. This doctor was supposed to go with the landing party, but also there was another doctor, another doctor that went in with all the landing party to understand. And I, he must be one of the bravest guys there ever was to go in there. what his name was? But, no, I don't remember his name. But he, he, he went in. And how we made out, I don't, well, you know, I, 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 he came back, because it would have hurt if he didn't come back, yeah. Mm. Um, during the time that you're on ship, you, you mentioned already about sandwiches and food. Talk a little bit about what, what kind of food were you, were you serving or being served? Well, we had a regular kitchen, and they, they served, it was good food. We had potatoes, we had, uh, oh, I, I can't think of what we had now. We said we have, must have different kinds of meat. We, we, we ate well in the trays, and that's how we fed the bed patients too, by the way. Uh, when these fellas were in the other compartment who were ambulatory would go to the chow hall to get something to eat, I stopped them and say, when you come back, would you bring back a tray for one of my patients? He said, sure, they all agreed. So, every, so everybody got fed that way, by, we, otherwise, me and this other guy couldn't carry all those trays back ourselves, so uh, they did. And you were helping feed your patients. Some of them had to be helped. Actually, I don't remember feeding any of my patients. I don't remember. Yeah, we had bad cases. One hand, hand arm, uh, his hand was off. And another guy, I think, was broken back. Another broken legs. And uh, um, they were they were bed patients, all right. But I think they could eat themselves. If if I suppose if they needed help, we um, and I think the guys in the other department probably come through and need it. Kind of helped them a little bit. They didn't help very much, but I think if somebody needed something, they would help. There was no problem. And then what happens to the patients at as they improve, how, do they, uh, are they transferred somewhere? No, um, like I mentioned before, the doctors were busy for three days, but when they finally got a little bit of sleep, they came down and redid the patients again, looked at the patients, see how, how our patients were going, because they must have saved the lives of the other patients, and somebody watch them, they could be called back right away if they had to be. So they were, I'm sure they came down and took care of our patients. But this little guy took care of all and fixed the wounds that one day to go. I think he did it all that one day. And so the patients eventually would leave you. They would go back to their uh, to their companies. What would happen? No, no. The oh no. When we get back to a neutral base after the 15th or 17th day, the ship sailed back to a neutral island. And all these islands had their own hospitals. And so we got them to a neutral island. We transferred them all to that island. And then when they got better and they couldn't, they couldn't fight anymore, they would finally get back to Honolulu and if Honolulu they didn't get home, something like that. So after the Iwo Jima campaign, where, where did you go from that point? What was your next stop? Well, that was the last one for me, Iwo Jima. Uh, somewhere, sometime, I'll come back and see. I mean, we, must have, we must have returned all the patients to an island, got transferred back to the Bolivar, and were somewhere in the middle of the ocean, I don't know where we were, and we heard that the ship was going back to the, to the States for repairs. 
and we did. We went back to the States. I, I don't know if we stopped at Honolulu first. I can't remember. If we did, we probably left off patients. If we did, somebody could, somebody could take the trip. But we went to the States, and I had liberty. I had a month of liberty after I got to the States. To the States, what, California? Where did California. You? California, but from California, uh, I was able to go home. I took a train home, and I remember that trip. It's about three and a half days on a train, and we could have flown, but I took a train because I had so much money on me, a certain amount, that if I took a train, I had that much money left over to spend home because it was a lot cheaper. Was, I think it was $72 round trip in those days for the, for the servicemen. But if I took a plane, it would cost me several hundred dollars. would eat up most of my money. So I took a train. So now you're on your way home. But before we get to your trip home, um, had you been communicating with your family? And if so, how? And didn't you also have brothers in the service? Yeah, I had. Talk about that. I, I had two older brothers in the service, Al and Frank. And uh, the, Al was in South Pacific like I was. He thought he saw my ship one time, APA 34, he probably did. But he was at Bougainville, and I remember hearing that was a tough, tough war right there. Bougainville was part of the Philippine Islanders, I guess. And Frank was at Guadalcanal. Frank came home, he was quite sick when he came home. They, Guadalcanal, when my brothers were in, was early in the war. It was one of the first places they hit, was Guadalcanal, I think. And it uh, seemed like we probably didn't have enough defense against the Japanese Zeros, was it, or Japanese planes. And they really could bomb us any time they wanted to, I guess. They not. But as the war went on, and Sikorsky, which I'm glad to say comes from Stratford, yeah, or AFCO, they made uh, our, with, with the fighter Corsair, plane, yeah. Corsair. They made the Corsair. We had a lot of Corsairs out there, so then they couldn't bomb as much. But Frank came home. He was sick. He came home. And he, he, he was just, we finally, we didn't know where he was at were first. The Navy also? No, Al and Frank were in the Army. And one of the reasons I did join the Navy, which I didn't say, was that my older brother wrote home and said to my mother, if he has got to go into service, tell him to go in the Navy. It's a much easier life. And I took it to advice. I probably would have followed if I would have gone. Out. So my brother Paul, after me, went in the Navy. My brother Larry, after me, went in the Navy also. So we had two in the Army and three in the Navy all in the service at one time, four of us overseas at one time. So you had five in the family at this, in during World War II? There were five of you? Uh, five of us. My two brother brothers, I was in and like, uh, Paul came in when the war was just ending, but, uh, and he was overseas too, but he wasn't in the warfare. Uh, Larry, was, Larry uh, was the only one of us that wasn't a barber, I forgot to tell that. And he, he went to, he graduated Michigan University and he went to uh, uh, officer's training school and he became a lieutenant and he, Larry did very well. So, so. But I, I forgot to tell that when I did all this core duty, or corpsman, that I was a barber and when I was a sophomore in high school. I worked with my father's barber shop all through my junior high school. So when I went to service, I didn't want to tell him I was a barber being afraid I'd get st stuck someplace in the States just cutting hair and I wouldn't learn anything. So I didn't tell them that. But when I got to these hospitals, I found out that barbering was a good job, and you know everybody, and uh, they needed barbers. So I would go right down to the office and tell them I was a barber. And as long as I wasn't doing hospital work, I could cut hair in a barber shop. The only time I had to stay at hospital work, if I had uh, watch duty, in case anybody got hurt, then I'd have to do my watch duty. But all the time I could cut hair. So I, I enjoyed cutting a lot of hair in the barber, and people knew me and I knew them. Uh, communication. How, were you getting letters? Yeah, I, I, want, I wanted to say that too. Um, I, I sent a letter home. I showed you a thing I sent to home, a prayer like. Um, but, you know, sugar was racing during the war. And my, my mother and two sisters, uh, they decided to make some fudge. And they made fudge. They packed it up and sent it to me. But by the time I got the fudge, it was all pottery. You couldn't could eat it. So. But I didn't want to say it wasn't any good. So I, when I wrote back, I said, yeah, the fuzz is very good. I get another letter right after saying, we're making you another bunch of fat fudge. So I finally had to send a letter saying, please don't make the fudge. I didn't want to tell them it was, you know, it was dry and kind of, <laughs> that's one of the things, that's one of the things. That, oh, and the other thing on board ship, when I'm going back with the casualties, the Evo, they were feeling better. I get, I'm getting better, my memory's getting a little better. And they were feeling better. 
and everybody had a card trick of his own. We started doing card tricks. One fella showed me a little bit of sleight of hand, how to cut the card, and it was great. So all the card, when I came home, I knew so many card tricks, and it was fun doing them. It was a pastime. But we did that on board ship coming home. And there was one guy who had a card trick that he wouldn't tell anybody. But I happened to be doing with another better patient, and he was showing me that same trick this guy wouldn't tell anybody. <laughs> so he didn't like it when I finally told him I knew how to do his trick. <laughs> Well, we did have some fun. We had some laughs, as you say, on the way home. You know, they were wounded and everything. So now, talk about what was it like you coming across country on a train, and you're coming back to home after a couple of years. Yeah, you're coming back home. What was? Who was here? Who did you meet? And what was that like? Well, I met a lot of other fellows who were doing the same thing I was coming home on a ship, and we get together, and the conductors were very nice. Uh, they, were, they set us up a little corner where we could play cars and stuff like that, and and then we did puzzles, and of course we couldn't wait till we got home, things like that, you know. So you got home, and who, who did you see? Your mother? Was yeah, there? when I got home, the first one I saw, the uh, the taxi driver, yeah, dropped me off at the house, and I went upstairs, and my, but they were waiting for me. I I, uh, I didn't call them until I was in New York City. It was two days trip on the train, more, three days maybe. When I was in New York City, I finally called him, told him where I was, I'd be home shortly. I didn't want them to be waiting for three days for me. So, uh, they were, of course, they were happy to see me. And, uh, so now you, you're home. When, are you out of the service now when you got home? Or were you on leave? No. Uh, I was on leave when I came home. And, so you had to go back? Yeah, I was on leave. You know, I'm getting mixed up. Um, first of all, when I, after, after we landed all the, all the people from Iwo Jima and came back to the States and everything. That's when I got a month's liberty. And I took a train, and I took a train, and I, uh, I had a round trip ticket. And when, when I got off that train, after being overseas so long, I think at that time I had a taxi drive me. Yeah, I saw my mother. Then uh, uh, that, I forgot what it was. My father had a bar shop right across from where I lived in Stratford Center. And the next time I came home, uh, I, I took a bus. I took a bu I, I, I took a bus from Bridgeport to Stratford. Uh, took a train or, or or taxi maybe, and I got out and I went right into the barber shop. Saw my father who was there working and whatnot. And then I crossed the street. Saw my family. So uh, you're out of the service now. You're back in in Stratford. Uh, pick up on that. What did you do? Uh, after that? Well, first thing I did, my, my older brother opened the barbershop at Hart's Corner, and I remember I came out of the service, he had a job waiting for me, and I came out of the service, and that Monday, I didn't take any time off, went right into the barbershop, started working. Later in years, I said, well, I know, I should have taken some time off, but I didn't. And then I started cutting hair again, and then I worked for him for a while, then I, I went to bar, went to hairdresser school, I wanted to be a hairdresser. And I no sooner got my hairdresser's license, I didn't stick with that. I stuck with the barbering trade, opened up a barbershop. And I've been in business for 63 years now. I started my barbershop on October 1st, 1948, and moved around the corner two years later than I have been there for over 60 years, same place. And you, you married, and you've been married for? I, I'm, I got married, I'm married for, right now, I've married 53 years. And I had two boys and two girls. And let's, I say, know, let's say their names. Your wife, your wife's maiden name. My, my wife's name is Antoinette. Antoinette. Her maiden name was Sperano. Her father used to be a policeman. I married Antoinette Sperano. And my son's name is David. And my other son's name is Jeffrey. And uh, uh, the two daughters was uh, Nancy and Janet. And between all of them, I have 13 grandchildren. One that's only two months old now, it's great. Wonderful. There's some are grown up, one's an attorney now, and the other, all, yeah, yeah. So you, um, you've been involved in some organizations. Uh, can you talk about your involvement in veterans organizations? Yeah. You know, 1947, we were starting a VFW, and I was asked to join, I said yes. So I am now, a, I am and was always a charter member of the VFW in Stratford in post number 9460. It's called the Raymond T. Goldback post. Raymond Goldback was killed in Europe 
in the war, World War II, on, on D-Day, I think, invading. I'm pretty sure that's correct. And we named the post. There was a Dr. Hydra who was lost someplace or oh, in an airplane crash or something. And between the two, uh, they, they, they we kind of voted on, on uh, I mean, gold bag, all back, although both of them, I'm sure, deserved to be, had the post named after them. So I'm a charter member there. In later years, uh, in 19, uh, 19, was 10 years ago, 19, what, 10 years ago, it would be 19, January, First, 19, yeah, 10 years ago, I I, uh, I became commander of the VFW and I enjoyed two years as commander of the VFW. I enjoyed marching with the color guard and I really enjoyed the VFW all these years and we've come a long way. And the main thing about our VFW is that we helped the West Haven Veterans Hospital, we helped them by taking care of a lot of the patients, being, entertaining them with bingos and bringing them to our club, feeding them and things like that. Did a lot of good. We're getting toward the end now, and uh, I would just like your, um, your, you to have an opportunity to explain how this, your time in the service may have influenced your life. When, now that you think back and reflect, how did that experience affect your life? Well, I think it made me grow up a lot. And when I was a kid, I was not in trouble, small things. I was very, I think I had the, I think I'm one of these problems, overactive kid and everything. But as soon as I got to boot camp, I knew I, I had to do what I was told and I did. Never had any problem in the service. And uh, it's, 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 it's part of growing up, I think. And when I came out and I had a trade, and one of the nice things is I had a trade when I went in the service. I don't think many kids have a trade after sophomore year of high school, but I did. And I worked there, and I was able to work. And uh, and from there around, life's been good to me. I can't complain. I just feel, I sometimes think back and feel that I'd be given this life and a long life, and this poor other poor guys, they come back. But I can't dwell on everything. I guess this is a picture. Huh? Well, is there finally? Is there anything we left out of this interview that you would like to add? Well, there was one time, and I think it was when I was at Leyte, might have been Luzon, but we, we had a, a patient that I, I don't think I mentioned it, huh? We had a patient that was, we had him sitting up in bed because I guess if he laid down, I don't know if he would bleed to death or wouldn't breathe right. I think it was, had to do with his lungs and everything. And we were hoping to keep him alive until we got to another, Island, which had a hospital, more equipment, and that would have been the next day. And so uh, I took care of him all that day. And then next morning when I got up and I looked in his room, the bed was empty. I knew he had died. They told me that even the doctor cries because he tried so hard to keep him alive. And so then they, they laid him out on the deck in canvas, canvas bag, some sort. and. Uh, I didn't like the idea that flies were flying around, but of course they couldn't get at them. It was covered up and everything. But they were waiting to get to shore for his burial there. But I did see, I did see, see uh, at Iwo Jima, I didn't mention to you that I did see sea burials. I saw at least one, maybe a couple of them. I went to see the sea burial. And I just felt I should. And I, I don't know where I got the time to go and see the sea burial, but I, I did witness the sea burial. And I guess that was what they did when they couldn't get, get your body back to the islands. You, you, the, the ship, I'm sure, went out of ways at night and, of course, marked exactly the spot where they're buried for future years and they had the sea burial. Thank you. And that concludes the interview of Emu LaRue. Thank you for serving our country, Emu. Thank you.